Hi there, my name is Pamela and I breed British Shorthair Cats in Perth, Western Australia. I've been breeding and exhibiting my cats since 2004 and I'm even a cat show judge. I'm passionate about the cat fancy and I want to share my knowledge and experiences with you so that you can enjoy your hobby as much as I do. That's what the Cat Breeding for Beginners podcast is all about. In this series, I'm taking a moment to answer some of the most regular cat breeding questions I get asked every day. Hopefully the answers will help you too. I'm also covering some topics that are important to new cat breeders so that you can start out on the right foot. Some of the episodes are scripted and some of them are off the cuff. The audio is both good and bad. But the main thing is the information and I'm sharing it in whatever way I can with you in mind. Well, what to talk about in this podcast, the um, thing that I'm getting people ask me the most questions about, as usual, is stud cats. And I had a really good question the other day because I'd actually shared on Facebook a a little video of a cat that I've been doing some work with. Um, His name is Vinny. And somebody said to me, could you please make a video of um, what to do when you're desexing and um, retiring stud cats. And I thought, well, I can't really make a video of that because that would be a boring video, just looking at one cat the whole time. But I can tell you about it in a podcast. So it's a good discussion topic. So I thought I might like to have a chat with you about that today. Now, when you have cats, um, when you're breeding cats, you always have to be thinking about what you're going to do with them in the future. So they have a life with you while they're breeding with you, but they have a life after that as well. And stud cats, for me, um, I'm, I'm someone who's very passionate about making sure that they're well kept and well looked after and well loved. And I have quite a few of them and I've had a lot of them over the years. And I'm very big on making sure that they have you know, a good life and enrichment in their life. And part of the deal is that when it's time, you actually desex them and move them either into a pet home or keep them as pets. They um, contribute to your breeding and stud cats can have a really big impact on your breeding. When you have a girl, a girl can have a litter or maybe two litters a season max. But a boy could pretty much have unlimited litters because you could put him with a different girl and a different girl and a different girl and you could have quite a lot of um, kittens from him over a season. So he can have a really big impact on your breeding. And what can happen is you get a boy and you kind of go one of two ways. You'll, you'll um, either breed him or buy him and he will um, be a stud cat for you and he will be a cat that you have for a short period of time or he'll be a cat that you have for a longer period of time. It's, um, it's depending on what your plans are and depending on what he brings to the table. So I have um, a lot of, I'm breeding colours and I need to move through the generations in those colours to bring those colours up to the um, the better type of my more traditional cats colors so I will have what I call one hit wonders and they'll be cats that have one season with me and then while they're still young they're desexed and they'll go off to their new homes and then I also have my more established boys who may have come to me from overseas or um, I might have bred them but for whatever reason I've decided that I need to keep them for a longer term so that they can have kittens for me for a longer period of time and often they're the ones that I will actually keep myself rather than rehoming them. But when it comes time, whichever way you do it, there's kind of things that you need to think about. So if we go back to that first example of, you know, the one hit wonder or the really young stud cat and Vinny's a really good example of that. Um, Vinny is a couple of, I think he's maybe two now, maybe a bit older, maybe two and a half. And um, Vinny did come to me from another breeder and um, Vinny came to me and he had, uh, he's had a, li- a season of um, kittens. He did come to me as an older, older kitten, I'd say. He was like mature. And he um, came, to, came to live with us and had um, a whole season of kittens and I have his daughters and I have, um, I think I might even have a grandson from him now. And he had a few litters for some other people as well. And he made a little bit of a contribution to some other breeds as well. So that was really nice. And he's kind of done his thing. And the thing about Vinny was that um, Vinny's behavior was getting a little bit ratty. And what I mean by that was that Vinny was getting a little bit slappy and a little bit, um, I don't know, just not 
exactly what I'd want in terms of how to look after a stud boy. So stud boys that are easy to look after and are pretty happy about being stud boys will tend to stay stud boys longer because they're just you know easier to look after. It's a bit like having a show cat. You need a show cat. It can be the most wonderful looking cat in the world but if it doesn't have a show cat's temperament it'll never be a show cat. So stud cats are the same and when they're not happy, if they're boys that are very whingy and whiny and want to be, um, you know, have company of other cats or have company of people or just are not cut out to be a stud cat, you will probably desex them earlier. But in Vinny's case, Vinny gave me what I needed from him and then his behaviour was getting a little bit, it was starting to deteriorate and I didn't feel like it was the right thing to do to keep him entire. So... Um, during the winter, so my cats breed seasonally, so the warmer months is when we're breeding and then over winter everybody sort of switches off for a little while. So over winter is a good time to be desexing your males because they're less likely to be as hopped up and hormonal as they are during the spring and maybe into summer. And also if they're seasonal like mine, they kind of go off a bit over winter. It's also a good time, um, especially if you have a seasonal breed, because that's around the time when kitten season's over, people might still be looking to adopt a cat or they might be looking to adopt a kitten, but rather than wait till spring, they might consider taking um, one of your cats as one of your retirees. So it's a good time to find them a home as well. And also it's a good time because when it's kitten season and you're dealing with all people to do with kittens, it can just be a little bit um, crazy and during um, winter I feel like I have more space to get my head around spending the right amount of time to find the right home. So that's what I did with Vinny. Um, Vinny was desexed uh, earlier this year and the first thing that happens when they're desexed is people just expect them to change overnight and they do not. They do not. The cat that you took to the vets is the same cat that you're taking home. Um, the, the changes in them take a lot of time. Uh, a good point to note is when you do take them in to get them desexed, it's a good time to do a few, um, give them a bit of a service at the same time, I like to say. I often have my cat's teeth checked. Um, if they need any vaccinations, updates, they'll get them then. Um, they obviously should be microchipped already. Uh, any other health checks, if they're slightly older, we might do a blood test. Um, we just want to make sure they're all good and healthy and happy at that point. So it's a good time to do it. And um, I've also had, when I've had cats that have had, you know, like a lot of stud tail or staining or, or whatever, from just the sort of boy grooming issues that you get. I've also got, um, I can think of one boy, we had his, um, he, we had him, we had him sort of clipped off, his feet clipped off because they were quite stained. So we had that done at the same time while he was under anaesthetic, which was good timing. So the cat that you take to the vet, same cat you're going to bring home. And to think that they're suddenly going to miraculously change into a different boy is just crazy. What you can do and what is a really good idea is if you can, while they're at the vets, just go and clean out their pen. Uh, clean it out, hose it out, wash it out, get rid of all the pee smelling stuff, but assume they're going to still pee when they get home. When um, Vinny wasn't much of a sprayer anyway, but when Vinny did come back, he did still continue to spray. So he had all new bedding and all new stuff in his pen, and it was cleaned out and washed out, but he still peed in there. Uh, it just was, it just sort of slowed down over time. And then the next thing with Vinny was we then watch his behaviour. So we watched him, um, and he was still the same sort of ready sort of attitude for a while there, but over time it slowly got a bit better and a bit better and a bit better. Then when I thought that he'd sort of calmed down a little bit, I then cleaned out his pan again and put fresh bedding in again and then waited to see what happened and I think he peed on it again. And then I did that um, probably about a week or so later and he had stopped peeing on things. So I waited a bit longer and a bit longer just to be sure. And then after that, I moved him out of that pen because I wanted to have him come out of being a stud cat being out of the stud cat pen and to move into being um, getting ready to be a pet boy. So he was quite um, vocal and a bit stressed, I think, in the bigger space. And then he was calming down a little bit as he was getting D6. So I brought him into the cattery, which is my barn, and I put him in a, um, a normal size pen in here. And he hosed it. He absolutely hosed it. There was pee everywhere. It was really bad. It was really bad. So I moved him into a smaller pen. I've got a half size pen and I put him in there and I found once I'd done that he calmed down even a bit more because 
you know, it's the same thing you have with stud, stud cats. If you give them a really big space, sometimes they think they have to coat it in pee. So in the smaller space, he calmed down a lot more and he did like the fact that he could jump up and there was some really good um, shelves in there that he could jump right up to the top and see what everyone was doing. So he was really happy in there, but he was still his behaviour was still a bit ratty. And I know that Damien in particular didn't like going in and dealing with Vinny because he felt that Vinny was going to, to you know, smack him and grab at his legs and that kind of thing. But he was a bit better than me, with me, and I, I'm shorter than Damien to start with, so I think that's probably sometimes with cats. It's a smaller person is less, less of a stress than the bigger person. So over time, um, I would go in with him and I would... Um, and he did pee in there a little bit, but not much. Uh, and that stopped pretty quick after that. So he was, that was a really good sign that the hormones were starting to leave his body. Because they're still in there. They're still in there for quite a while until, you know. And a, a boy that's G-sex can actually still get a girl pregnant for quite a little while afterwards as well. Because, you know, they still they might have their testicles removed, but they might still have some stuff in their tubes is probably the best way to describe it. So Vinny went into this pen and he was... Um, in there and I'd go in there to feed him and go in there to pat him and I'd make sure that I was super careful and I treated him the same way that I would treat a cat at a show um, when I was stewarding it or judging it with handling it I would put my um, hands I'd be cautious of where I was putting my hands and um, making sure that I had control of his body but I would then put him on the, the little bed and I'd give him a good scrunch and I'd, I'd talk to him and pat him and, and try to get him used to being um, given attention and loved and everything and over time, he just got better and better and better. And he didn't get so agitated when I would come in to do his feeding. He would just come over, have a look, how you doing? Give me a bit of a smooch, have a bit of a snack, go over and give himself a clean. Um, and progressively, he's just gotten better and better and better. But this is a process that has taken several months. So the idea that you can just go, well, I don't want this boy anymore. I'm going to desex him and then I'll palm him off to someone else is crazy. It's irresponsible and it's just wrong. It's not fair on your cat. It's a process that takes time. So you need to plan it out. You need to have that pen that you're going to keep him in for that time as well because you can't just take him in and make him a house cat. And he'll be taking up that pen until he's ready to go. And so I'm fine with him in the smaller pen. I'll, I'd like to try him again in a bigger pen, but I think he's pretty happy where he is now. And I think he might be ready to go from there maybe to um, someone's home. And that'll be the next step for him. I'll start talking um, and letting people know that he's available um, and hearing what they have to say about, you know, have they had cats before, have they had British before, um, all of those sorts of things, because it takes a while to find the right house. And often it's someone that doesn't necessarily want a adult cat. They may, um, sorry, don't want a kitten. They don't want to have to deal with having a kitten. So they want to have an adult cat because it's just, um, they don't want to deal with the baby factor. And that's fine, but you need to realise that you're not rehoming a normal G-sex cat, you're rehoming an ex-stud cat and there's some things that might be a bit of a concern there. So I think when Vinny goes to his new home, he is going to need to go into a smaller space before he's given free run of the house. He's going to need to be um, gradually let out over time. He's going to need the person to go and spend time with him and be careful and cautious around him and give him love but also be aware that he is, you know, he has... Um, he is going to be nervous about moving to a new location. And this is a cat that he's lived in a few places before he came to me, which is unfortunate, but he's going to now find the home that he's going to live in forever. I think he's got a lot of um, he's got a lot of love to give and I think he'll be a wonderful pet and he's starting to get all fat and beautiful as well, which probably will help make him a little bit more relaxed. But it is absolutely about finding the right person. And that person is going to have to understand that he, he he's been a really good boy he's using his litter tray perfectly he's peeing in his litter tray but when he moves he may have a few accidents just because he may revert to that bad behavior now he wasn't a cat that was super pissy though he was a cat that was pretty good as far as spraying went um the other situation i've had of, of rehoming boys is i've rehomed an older boy so i've rehomed my boy teddy and teddy was always going to stay with us permanently and teddy lived with his brother petey who was desexed and he was filthy, absolutely filthy. So every day Teddy would pee in his um, fold-up chair and um, the next day he would pee in, his, in Petey's chair. 
and then he'd poop on one and then he'd poop on the other. So every day was pee and poop, pee and poop in the chairs, he'd pee on the floor, he'd pee on everything. He was dirty and noisy and, you know, difficult, I'd say, is probably how I'd describe him. But at the same time, he was vital to my breeding program because he was the first Australian cat that I bred that ever carried cinnamon. And I didn't, I didn't have it, things the way things were with my breeding program, I needed to keep him entire for quite a while to sort of get the critical mass that I needed for the colour that I was breeding. He had a really, you know, good time as a, as a stud cat. He had lots of girls. He had um, a really nice um, pen that he lived in, a nice big pen. He loved his hammock. He was quite a happy cat um, as a stud. He just was a bit vocal um, during the breeding season. But he's just really dirty, really dirty. So when it was time to de sex Teddy... I was keen to do it because I wanted him to be able to have a pet life. But I knew that with Teddy, I always assumed it may not work. I always assumed this cat may live in this same uh, lifestyle that he lives as a stud cat. He may live that same lifestyle for the rest of his life as a desex cat. So it was a bit of a roll of the dice as to how things were going to go with Teddy. So Teddy was desexed at... Uh, I, I, I think it was either 11 years or 12 years old and he was um his teeth were done he had a few other things done he was you know given a bit of a tidy up and he came back to live um, in his pen now i had got rid of those chairs that he peed on pooed on um i cleaned his pen out scrubbed it all fresh bedding all that kind of stuff and the hosing just continued the hosing continued the pooping stopped the po i mean he pooped in the tray but the pooping um well, he didn't have a chair to poop on, so he didn't poop on the chair. So that was a good thing. But he was peeing on everything, peeing on his hammock, peeing on the floor, peeing wherever he liked. So that was Teddy. Um, after a while, the peeing did slow down and stop. So I thought, great, well, I'm not quite ready to do anything else with this cat yet because he, he, he never had, he never made me nervous with his behaviour. He just made me nervous that he would pee on things. So I thought, right, okay, well, I've got two new chairs. I'll put them in there for him and see what happens. No, straight back to peeing and pooing on the chairs. Okay, well, I won't give him the same chairs. I'll give him two different chairs. I'll give him plastic chairs. No, peeing and pooing on the chairs. Okay, no chairs for you, Teddy. No chairs for you. Took the chairs out, and over time, and this was a really long process, over time um, I was able to um, keep checking, and the spraying had stopped. So... He and his brother came into the barn and they came into the same um, big pen that Vinny came into, not the same pen, but the same size pen, and they did really well. I mean, there was a little bit of spraying uh, in the bedding area, but then that was I washed that and that was it, and they were done. And they, had, they, they loved it out here. They had um, heated beds and they were hanging out together and very happy, but we felt that because he'd been a stud cat for so long, it was important to us that he got to have some house time and, and, and be a house cat as well. So after um, after I was really sure, and he'd had, I think he stayed out in the barn for uh, the rest of winter. Um, so maybe a year or maybe, yeah, it was probably maybe even two, a year or two years after that, um, we were ready to, uh, from the process of desexing, he'd, he'd been outside for another several months and then inside in the barn for several months. And we decided we were ready to bring him inside. But unfortunately, he had an ear infection and he had a polyp in his ear and he needed to have surgery on that. And he couldn't come inside because that, that was quite yucky and bleh. So that all had to be dealt with. But fast forward to when that was resolved and we brought him into the house and he didn't spray at all. He didn't spray at all. He sleeps on the bed. He's a lazy, lazy boy. His brother runs around the house yelling at me all the time. Um, and he has lost weight because he's been running around the house yelling at me all the time. But those two boys now live in the house and they're really happy, really happy. So that's two examples of cats that I have um, de-sexed. I have cats that I've de-sexed and retired. Um, I've also retired a couple of young boys that I can think of and they have gone on to go live in pet homes. One boy, I knew I was only wanted, I wanted one season out of him. I wanted one litter out of him. There was one mating I wanted. I'd actually wanted to keep a girl from his mum, but he, I never got a girl. So I kept a boy and I, 
I, he was a real one hit wonder just that one season uh, I think he had two litters and I kept a girl from one of them so he actually uh, was desexed early he actually never went out in a stud pen he did um, come out into the barn and he was in a pen in the barn and he didn't actually go um, he didn't spray or anything like that and he had girls here in the barn but he never went outside into one of my outside stud runs because I didn't want him to learn any bad behaviours. I wanted him to be as pet-like as possible so that it would be a really good transition for him when I finally did de-sex him and um, find him a pet home. So he went off to have a really lovely life with someone as their pet. Uh, I have um, de-sexed a boy who was a bit older, uh, my boy Bentley. Bentley um, was wonderful. Oh, Bentley's just a gorgeous boy, gorgeous boy, big fat lump he is now. Bentley was desexed probably, he wasn't a one hit wonder in any way, shape or form, but Bentley made it pretty clear that he wasn't super happy as a stud cat. He, um, unlike some of my other, most of my other boys, he wasn't super lazy and relaxed about it. He was actually quite uh, vocal and quite sort of not happy. Or probably, probably similar to how I sort of felt that Vinny was. Um, but he did stay in Tyre for probably a little bit longer than Vinny. Probably, I think it was maybe four or five, I think, when he was desexed. I'd have to, I have, I, I'm not sure. Um, and he went to live with a lovely couple who were wanting to adopt an adult cat. And um, they wanted a cat that was, you know, going to be a good cat that would be lazy and just they um, hang out and, and, you know, be a sort of a British shorthair, basically. So when he was desexed, um, that for me was... Oh, absolutely heartbreaking. He he was desexed, and we did the same process that we've done with all the other boys, and we got him to the point where he could be um, he could be retired. He could go to live with a home in a pet home, and that was the thing that was devastating to me because that cat, I absolutely adored that cat, loved that cat, um, still love that cat, and he he was just so special to me. But at the same time, I had to, you know, and I remember crying when he went. Um, I had to put that all aside because really he was a cat that didn't love being a stud cat. He wasn't a cat that was going to love just being, you know, in a pen as a desex cat. He was a cat that wanted to be with people and be loved and have a family life. So I had to really, you know, choke back my own feelings and put his feelings first and find him the very best pet home I could find. And his family has now had... Um, They've had a baby. He's he hangs out with the baby. They send me pictures. I I just I love it, and I don't regret it at all because it's he's having a wonderful wonderful life with his family. Um, I I miss him, and I I love him very much. But I think I really did the right thing by him in doing that. And um, yeah, sometimes you just have to, you know, even though you adore a cat, sometimes you have to let them go. Um, yeah, that's very sad because I do miss him quite a lot. So there's there's things that people will say to you when they talk about you know when you you rehoming a stud cat and what you should do with a stud cat when you're rehoming when you're desexing them or retiring them, and people will say you should give them an injection of this or an injection of that, or female hormones that you should give them when you desex them so that they stop spraying and and you know all that kind of stuff. And literally, no, I, I, don't intervene. They they need to. You need to give them time. That's what you need to give them. Don't inject them with anything. Just give them time because they need time to learn how... They need time to get the hormones out of their system. They also need time to calm down. Um, they need time to change their behaviours. And then when that's happened, that's when you can change their environment. If you change their environment straight away, they're still the same cat that you took to the vets. They're just going to behave the same way when you get them home. If you if you took a boy to the vets and had his testicles cut off and came home and let him run around in the house, he's going to pee on everything. He's going to behave exactly as he would if you hadn't have cut them off. So, yeah, you have to be just ready to have time. And it takes a lot of planning. And I think it's best to do it... Um, you know, while well, there's other stuff not necessarily going on. So maybe when you're not having kitten season or maybe when you're not doing it like five of them all at once or, you know, one at a time. And also find them a really special home. Find them an absolutely wonderful home. I make my retiree adopters jump through hoops 
way more than I do kitten owners and I make them jump through hoops too but the people that are getting my retirees these are cats that I've I've known as cats they weren't kittens that left me at 12 weeks old these are cats that I've had personal experiences with I've shared my life I've shared their life with with them you know while they've been with me we've been through ups and downs that kind of thing so these are cats that are really special to me and dear to my heart and I, I feel like I owe them to find them someone really wonderful for them to live with. Now sometimes that person can be someone who already has a cat or kitten from you and they might be ready for another one but maybe they don't want a kitten or maybe they don't have the, the money to buy a kitten. Maybe they actually want the cat that's related to their cat. Maybe they want to adopt their cat's dad or their cat's brother. Maybe that's what they're, they're looking to do. So don't discount um, the fact that you might already have the contacts there. And if someone says, you know, oh, I really love that boy, you know, when it's time to retire him, can you let me know? First of all, make sure they're serious and then plan what you need to do to, um, if it's a good home, if it's someone that's already got kittens of yours, for example, plan what you need to do to do the matings that you need from that boy and then get him de-sexed and get him ready so that they can have him because good homes, really, really good homes, for um, retirees, you know, they're, they're, they don't come along that often. They'll often be the people that you'll be the most connected with in terms of going forward with your cats. Um, I still get, um, and this is a female, but I still get um, pictures of Josie uh, from her, her owner, who's an older lady who wanted an older cat because she didn't want a kitten because she was an older person herself. And, you know, people think of timing and that's really wonderful. Um, and she'll send me pictures of this cat, Josie. She'll be on Josie's mat on the couch. You know, Josie has her own bed on the couch and she's got the dog and she's sleeping with the dog and she's just had this put in for her and that put in for her and bought this for her and bought that for her. And I absolutely love it. I love it. I love seeing my kittens happy, but I love seeing my adults happy even more. So you need to really be planning what you're going to do with these cats so that you can um, make decisions about when it's time for them to move on. The other thing you need to think about is, you know, you have an adult cat, you have a stud cat, and he's been with you and you've had a litter from him this year and two litters next year and then maybe two litters the next year. Um, what are you doing? You know, is this cat just sitting there hanging out waiting for you to do stuff and he's just living it he could be living you know he could be living a better life but you're not really sure what you're doing with your cats you're just sort of making it up as you're going along yes I have kept stud cats for a long time I think uh, I think the oldest was Teddy when I desexed him you know but I had purpose and reason for doing that so whilst um, I did keep him for longer and he did have to live that lifestyle for longer. There is at least a reason to that. If I can, I will, um, you know, line up what you need. Sometimes you have to wait because you know you've got to wait till the daughter of the granddaughter, you know, the daughter or the granddaughter has been born before you can do the mating that you need to do or whatever. But if you can do it so that you've lined it up, you've got what you need, you've got that genetic material secure, you've got your insurance policy of maybe another couple as well then move them on um, so that they can have that better life because it's going to take you a bit of time to do and um, it's you're doing it for them, not for you. But having them just sitting out there sort of waiting for you to get your stuff together and get sorted out, it's not really that, that fair on the cat. Now, when you do rehome them, I always have a price involved in that. I always have a price involved because I need my cats to be valued. I need them to be valued so that I can make sure the person getting them is getting them for the right decisions. I never give away my cats. If you have a stud cat that doesn't stop peeing or doesn't stop bad behaviour or is a bit snarky or whatever, don't think that you can just give him away for free and wash your hands of it. That's just really bad. If you have a cat that's, that's not... Um, if you have a cat that you actually don't feel that you could charge someone money for, then you should be keeping that cat and giving them the best life that you can give them because you're the best place, you're the best person to have them 
you know don't make them someone else's problem if it's someone that's really willing and able to to deal with that problem say if a cat has a medical issue and they know about that and they're okay with that and they're willing to do it because their last one had one the same or whatever okay there's some sort of circumstances where that would be okay but if your cat has a problem that means that it's difficult for you to keep him then don't pass him on to somebody else and make him you know their problem I also don't believe in passing studs around. I think there's almost, it's like really, really limited circumstances where you would actually sell a stud to someone else as a breeding cat. Um, now, Vinny's a good example of the limited circumstances. Vinny was um, a young boy and he hadn't had any kittens yet and he was a carrier of the cinnamon gene, which is quite, you know, harder to get and he was a different line to my cats. And his owner... Um, was actually not able to keep him because this happened during COVID, during the first, you know, the really big lockdowns where everybody lost their job and she actually did lose her job and um, needed to downsize her um, breeding cats. And he he was offered to me because he had that, that cinnamon gene and he, he'd already made a big, um, you know, he'd already made a big contribution by actually... Um, coming over from another state, coming to live here... Um, you know, growing up and he hadn't yet had a litter and all of that effort that was put into getting him here and for him to be a stud cat for that period of time and then not actually pass on his genetic material just seemed like a really big waste of everybody's time, including his. So he came to live with me and um, like I said, I had him for that season. I got the litters that I needed. I actually helped a few other breeders as well and then as soon as I, I was ready... Oh, and I did do it because he was getting, like I said, a bit slappy, but I was ready to do it pretty soon. I, I had somebody else that wanted to have a litter from him if possible, but I said, no, you can have a litter from one of his children instead because I wanted to de-sex him because of that. But he was he would have only have lasted maybe another half a season and I would have de-sexed him anyway. So he was passed, not passed on, that sounds terrible, but passed around is what people say when, when stud cats get sold on to other breeders, we'd call it passing around and it's just not done in the cat fancy. But he was he was um, sold to me in that way. But I feel that that's a bit different to just, I don't need this cat anymore, who wants to give me the most money for it, thanks, I'll take that money, there you go, you can have the cat. So I think that's a different circumstance and I don't know that that's ever something... I, I would never do that. I would never do that. If I if I get a boy, he, um, in exchange for him having to live the life of a stud cat, at the end of that he gets retired and he gets to go and live the life of a king in, in um, either in a pet home with someone who adores him or with me, you know, and um, he he will have, you know, I want him to be happy for the rest of his life, not just be concerned with the time that he's with me and then after that I don't care anymore. So yeah, that's my feelings about stud cats. Um, I, I, I didn't realise until I started doing podcasts and videos, I didn't really realise that there was so uh, such a small amount of information out there for people about keeping stud cats and what to do when you've got stud cats and, and dealing with them and dealing with the before and the after and, and, and what they do for you in terms of like mating and things like that. I really didn't know, I, I really just assumed everybody knew as, as much as I did, but it turns out that it's actually something that's a little bit specialised maybe, I don't know. I think it's probably because breeding the colours that I have, I've needed to have quite a few boys. I have a massive amount of space, so I can do that. And maybe that's why I've had a range of cats and a range of situations, and that's all information that I'm more than happy to share with you because as a new breeder, um, you know, the, the, when you get to the point of having your own stud cats, that's when you know things are serious because, you know, like I keep saying, stud cats, you can have a stud cat, you can love them like a pet cat, but they are not a pet cat. They do need their own housing, they do need their own um, special care, you do need to be cautious about the way you behave with them and, and how they go and what you do with them. And um, I'm just happy that by passing on information about that, that there's going to be hopefully be some happier stud cats out there. And I'm hoping that there'll be stud cats that, that make a contribution to your breeding and then go forward to go and live a wonderful life. Um, but that's what I do when I uh, desex my stud cats, when I retire them. And this season coming up, I've got a few boys, younger boys that are going to be 
retired and I've got some older boys that are going to be retired and some of them will go to pet homes and some of them will stay with me and um, that's just the way it's going to be. I do have hopes that one boy in particular, I think I might show him as a de-sex cat. I don't know. I've got to, I don't know, I might, you know, keep them, some of the, some of the boys I have, I've got some really fabulous show cats as well that are my stud cats as show cats because I do like to show a stud male. Um, but they can also go and then maybe be shown as de-sex as well. And um, I do know that if I, I've got a couple of boys that I think will um, have a lot of interest if I did tell people that I was letting them go as pets. I don't think I'd have any trouble finding homes for them. Um, and I really hope that when the time comes for you to retire your boys, that, that you either keep them and love them or that you can find them a really wonderful home. Um, just give them time, give them time, they need time, but then you can find them a wonderful home and that they can go and be loved by a special family. Okay, there you go. That's a little bit more about stud cats for you. I am sure I'm going to talk more about stud cats in the future. If you have questions about stud cats, make sure that you, um, you ask me, basically, and I'll be happy to help. Okay. Thanks for listening to the Cat Breeding for Beginners podcast. Make sure you visit my website at catbreedingforbeginners.com for lots more information. You can sign up to my email list and stay tuned as my Cat Breeding 101 online course is coming soon.